Hi, it's Sally from Field to Fork here. How good to see you again and welcome to the Hursle in winter. When it's cold at this time of year, like it is today, it's just about freezing and the days are short, it can be tempting to stay cosied up indoors and not venture anywhere. But actually, just by putting on a few more layers of clothing and your hats and gloves, you can get out there and find what there is of interest in nature at this time of year. And there is plenty. When the days are short, there's more chance of seeing those creatures that feed by day because they're needing to take on a lot extra food to give them the energy to survive the cold and they've not got much time to do it in. And for those that hunt by night, you've more chance of seeing them in the twilight at the end of the day or in the morning. So let's take a look around the hearsal and see what there is of interest in winter. There has been a keen frost over the last few days and so the lake is gradually becoming more and more frozen, which means the area of clear water for the birds to occupy is getting smaller and smaller. So this can be difficult for them because that's where their safety lies away from predators and also where they need to feed. Today we can see mute swans, mallards and tufted ducks. When we see birds like the swan walking on the ice, we may be tempted to do so ourselves but it's not a good idea. The ice would never hold our weight. And if we happen to fall through, the water is extremely cold and it's very difficult to get back out of. The mallards are making the most of some extra feeding that somebody's put out for them. At this time of year, you can see the distinction between the males and the females very clearly. Frozen puddles on the path. And the contrast between the green evergreens and the bare deciduous trees is very clear to see. Evergreen trees are able to hold onto their leaves or more often needles over the winter because they are tough and waxy and so don't lose water. We can particularly notice the shape and the structure and the bark and the twigs of the deciduous trees when there's no leaves to hide them. These are our oaks so you can see the bark of them is rough and fissured and their twigs are brown with brown round buds along them and at the end. The buds are already forming for the new leaves to burst from in spring. Look at the gnarled and twisted shape of the branches in this oak tree which will be getting on for 300 years old. A beech tree has smooth grey bark and buds that are long and pointed and brown. An old sycamore has flaky bark. The tall slender silver birches with their silvery bark and feathery twigs. An ash tree has distinctive branches turning upwards at their ends. Sadly, many of our ash trees are succumbing to ash dieback, a disease which slowly kills them. The black pointed buds of the ash are easy to recognise and remember. If you think of burning, turning things black and leaving ash. The large brown buds of a horse chestnut are sticky to touch. Some trees are even in flower in wintertime. These are the catkins 
on the alder. So the lamb's tail catkins of a hazel. They come in winter before the leaves so that the pollen can be shaken from the male catkins and caught by the female catkins before the leaves get in the way. The evergreen ivy has its fruit at this time of year. There are now not many berries left on the holly because they've been providing vital food for birds such as blackbirds and song thrushes. The seed heads of the reeds will give extra food for little birds. Here's Mr. Robin with his lovely red breast being very brave. In winter time, they seem to be particularly keen to be close to us. When the hedges are bare, it's a good time to spot the birds' nests that were used last year. Can you see the squirrel? The moles are busy pushing up their hills of soil. The maize, which did very well this year, is still standing to provide game cover for pheasants and partridges and other wildlife. And to provide food as well, they'll come and eat the cobs. You can see this one's been nibbled. Fields with the stubble left over from last year's crop will be ploughed ready for sowing again over the winter, or they might already have been planted with next year's crop. This is not a field of grass, but of winter cereals. It was sown in the autumn, so it means it has a head start and will be ready for harvesting in July next year. The oilseed rape crop for next year is also already planted. These small cabbage-like plants can withstand the frost. The Highland cattle are given some extra feeding, hay this is, over the winter because there's not much nutrients in the grass and also because they are carrying their calves which they'll give birth to in the next two or three months. Here are the calves from last spring that are now old enough to live independently of their mothers. They're having a tussle. Can you see the green shoots that are poking through here? New growth for the spring. The first of the snowdrops and the aconites too. Here are the small yellow ones at this time of year. Incredibly, a daffodil flowering. First spotted on the 5th of January, the earliest Wolf the Groundsman has ever seen. How many of these signs of winter can you find around where you live? Or maybe catch those hints of spring? Dress up warm and get out there and see what you can find. And if you enjoy that, Look out for more Field to Fork videos of things to do outdoors in winter.